faith restoring election security or voter suppression aimed at Democrats. Inside the Texas Capitol, the battle over ballot box integrity rages on. On the southern border, the crisis deepens. With new claims, immigrant children have been sexually victimized while in U.S. custody. And the growing controversy over vaccine passports. Should Texans provide proof of inoculation as a matter of workplace safety? I'm Greg Grugan and welcome to Watch Your Point where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, Fox 26 legal and political analyst, Chris Tritico. Up next, Charles Blaine, founder of Urban Reform. In the three spot, Republican strategist, Jessica Colon. Batting cleanup, longtime Houston journalist and social worker with the Houston Area Women's Center, Chow Nguyen. And rounding us out, well-known businessman and columnist, Bill King, let us begin. Claiming far too many Texans have lost faith in our elections, Republican state lawmakers this week moved a slate of reforms and restrictions a step closer to becoming law. Aimed at reducing the likelihood of fraud, House Bill 6 and its Senate counterpart roll back pandemic-driven experiments in Harris County, like 24-hour polling places and drive-through voting, while also imposing harsh criminal penalties for those convicted of breaking the rules. Labeled voter suppression and Jim Crow 2 by Harris County Democrats, the Republican bills have drawn public opposition from big-name Texas corporations like Dell Computer and American Airlines, pushback which ignited the fury of Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. Well, let me tell you what, Mr. American Airlines, I take it personally. You're questioning my integrity and the integrity of the governor and the integrity of the 18 Republicans voted for this. When you suggest that we're trying to suppress the vote, you are in essence between the lines calling us racist and that will not stand. Patrick went on to call out Judge Lena Hidalgo and Mayor Sylvester Turner as race baiters and liars. Panel, Rice political scientist Mark Jones called the Democratic suppression charge disingenuous hyperbole, in large part because HB6 and Senate Bill 7 essentially reinstate the election standards in place before the pandemic. What do you think of that read, Charles Blaine? Yeah, so this is the second week in a row that I have to go kind of full partisan with this, and it's unfortunate because I don't like to do that. But the simple fact is that every single time we see any election integrity bill come up or any bill that Democrats don't like, they liken it to Jim Crow because they know it brings back a very bad memory to a lot of their base, and it's really wrong to continue to exploit that. This bill does not do that. It is not Jim Crow. People still have the same ability to vote post this bill being uh, uh, voted on as they did prior to it. And the corporations that are coming out against it, most of them have not read the bill because if they did, I don't think they would be as angry as they are. And the problem is, is that they are just responding to the bases, the democratic bases anger about this that is being fed by these elected officials. And I will go back to what I said last week. If, a, if our county judge wants to talk about voter suppression, why don't we talk about how she took the power away from two elected, duly elected black women who were elected to oversee our county elections and gave it to an appointed official who's shielded away from the voters um, level of accountability. So I really I get really frustrated with this, especially when they go to this Jim Crow language because it's wrong. All right, Chris Tritico, you know your way around election law. Is the suppression label accurate? Well, it seems to be heading that direction. And look, at the lieutenant governor, all, all the lieutenant governor is saying to these corporations is, why don't you just shut up and write checks? That's really what they want. You don't you don't don't come and tell me uh, what to say or what to do. Just write me a check and be quiet and I'll be happy. And, we'll, and we're going to do what we want and you'll be happy with it. These measures that they're rolling back in, in the Senate bill and the House bill were all approved by the courts. And what they don't want is to expand voting. There wasn't a problem with the election. Everybody was happy. More people voted in the last election than any election in American history. Nobody was upset. Nobody was mad. Nobody was angry. And quite frankly, there is no evidence of widespread voter fraud. So stop all this. Stop all this hype and let the people vote. It's just that simple. 
Jessica Colon, uh, Patrick talks about polling that shows a huge swath of the American public, 30, 40% have lost in some part faith in the process. What are you hearing in Austin? That's accurate. And I respectfully have to disagree with my good friend, Chris. Uh, actually, what Lieutenant Governor was saying was that the high paid, powerful attorneys at these corporations did not read the legislation before casting their dispersions on this um, on, on this matter, as as Charles said. And that's the brass tax of it. Uh, you know, these corporations have pay a lot of money to their attorneys, and I'm pretty stunned and we should all be stunned that they're casting an opinion before reading the bill. Uh, this bill really goes into the process that happens at the polling location. Uh, we were talking earlier that a lot of voters didn't really feel that, that they had a bad experience at the polls. That's really not what this bill is necessarily about. It's more about poll watchers and how the ballots are handled and can people be there um, and how poll watchers are being uh, treated and having access at the ballot board. That's really, it's really about the process of protecting the integrity of our votes from the very moment that they're cast to the moment that they're counted. And that's what these bills are about. So let's just be clear and make sure that we're all talking about the same topics. Bill King, what's your take? I think this is both parties talking to their bases. There's not there's not any kind of significant election fraud. There's not kind of any significant uh, voter oppression. Not, Chris Perkins, a, a Republic, very respected Republican pollster, uh, ran a poll. Ninety seven percent of uh, of Texans thought that there were no problems with the election. Uh, Eighty seven percent had a uh, or ninety or eighty three percent had a good experience uh, at the polls. Or maybe I've got those reversed. Uh, look. If you should go out and poll the American people, this is not what they want to know is why did we freeze in the dark? Why did the city of Houston not able to deliver water in the middle uh, of, a, of a snowstorm? That's what we want to know about. This is all partisan fringe, and it shows the degree to which our the political agenda has been captured by pe the 10 or 15 percent on both sides. Those in the middle are not worried about this. The one thing I'm absolutely opposed to in these bills, though, are the more severe criminal penalties for assisting voters. I think that's a very dangerous road to go down. All right, Chow Win, jump in here. Yeah, and I, I absolutely agree with the data. Let the data speak for itself. If the people are happy with the voting process, the status quo doesn't mean it's right. The status quo is why we've had slavery for hundreds of years. Racist policies produce racist outcomes, so make that very clear. All right, well, we're going to leave it right there. Up next, Deshaun Watson's accusers revealed, but should these alleged victims be compelled to go public with their identities? And later, crushing expert testimony in the trial of George Floyd's alleged killer. Given the evidence so far, is there any way Derek Chauvin walks away a free man? The ongoing sexual harassment and assault allegations aimed at Texans quarterback Deshaun Watson took a turn this week with two accusers stepping forward and revealing their identities. Watson's lawyers have demanded the names of the remaining 20 women suing their client who contends he's done nothing wrong and that all interactions were consensual. Judges have thus far granted that request in at least 13 of the cases. Panel, given the sexual nature of these civil claims and the possibility that these women could later be designated crime victims, are you okay with their identities being revealed? Chow Wen, I've got to go to you on this one. Mm -hmm. Well, as a representative of the Houston Area Women's Center, we support survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence. And here's what I can tell you. Sexual assaults are one of the most underreported crimes. 90% of them go underreported. Of the 10% that get reported, only 7%, and Chris can appreciate this being a lawyer, 7% of those cases make it all the way through disposition because it is so tough for survivors to share their story. And they absolutely should deserve the privacy and the confidentiality they choose. If they choose to speak out, like the young woman who spoke out this week with Tony Busby and his lawyers, allow them to choose. But on the same day, I should mention, the same day that that press conference was taking place, we were in the legislature talking about confidentiality for sexual assault survivors, lobbying for it, and getting bipartisan support because we know how hard it is to share your story, to come forward, because you're going to be subject to shame, blame, social media judgment, ridicule. Let survivors choose on their own whether or not they speak out. 
All right, Chris Tritico, let's say you're representing Deshaun Watson. Should he have a right to uh, confront his accusers in a court of law in a public fashion? Not only should he have a right, he does have a right. The, the, the problem with this situation is what the way Tony Busby's handling it. In, in any case where I'm representing someone who's criminally accused, the state has the right to, and, uh, and most of the time does, shield the name of the complaining witness in, in a case where there's a sec, been an alleged sexual assault. But I get that name, and I get to know what she has accused my client of. I get all of that information and I get to investigate the case and the facts. And so I'm prepared for trial. What Tony Busby's doing is he is not giving the name, not providing the facts, and then going on, on the media every day calling press conferences, beating Deshaun Watson about the head and shoulders. So he's using the rape shield law as both a sword and a shield. And that's why the courts are forcing him to disclose the name of the complainant, of the, of the alleged victim. He can't do that which he is doing. And it's a case like this and tactics like this that causes these types of laws to fall as unconstitutional. It's what Tony Busby's doing that's forcing his clients' names to be made public. Had he used the law correctly and filed it as a Jane Doe, but provided the information with a protective order, none of this would have happened. It's Tony Busby's wrongful tactics that are causing his clients' names to be made public solely. All right, Charles Blaine is an African-American man about five years older than Deshaun Watson. Uh, you know, is he being treated fairly? Well, one thing I want to say first is that I'm really glad that that Chow was able to give us those sobering statistics because when this first came up, I said on this show that one of the things that I was having trouble reconciling was that they didn't go to HPD and that that shows why they didn't that so many of them go unreported because so many of them um, are questioned. And so I'm, I'm really glad to hear those statistics. My issue is that I do feel that he needs to have the ability to know who is who is accusing him. They said that he gets two to three massages outside of the Texans organization a week. That's roughly 150 or more a year. And so if you're being accused of something happening in one, two, even 30 of those out of two to three you get a week, it's hard to know which ones they are accusing you of doing wrongdoing in and being able to mount a defense against if you don't know who the person is. That's like if you get coffee every every morning for a year and then suddenly you're being accused six months, eight months ago of having stolen something at this coffee shop and you you can't understand which place that was because they're not telling you where it is. Now, obviously, two very different experiences, and I'm not trying to minimize their experiences. I'm just saying that it's really hard to know if you don't know who they're accusing you of doing something to. And so I, I do feel that he has a right to know who's making these accusations. All right, we're going to leave it right there. Coming up, tragic collateral damage emerging from the border crisis. Allegations of immigrant children being sexually assaulted while in federal custody. Our panel dives in after the break. The state of Texas investigating claims that immigrant children housed at San Antonio's Freeman Coliseum suffered sexual abuse while in custody. Breaking the news was Governor Greg Abbott, who blasted the facility sheltering 1,300 unaccompanied teens as a, quote, health and safety nightmare. The Biden administration is now presiding over the abuse of children. To end this abuse, the Biden administration must immediately shut down this facility. And border policy. Panel, there are now more than 20,000 undocumented kids in federal custody with more coming. Uh, gotta he hear what Jessica Colon thinks about this. I mean, the governor drove to San Antonio to do this press conference. Yeah, this is, this is a tragedy, and it's a tragedy that's been made by this administration. The way in which this border has been opened when Joe Biden was sworn in as president has created all the problems that we have right now. It is a fact that these were issues that were clamped down upon during the Trump administration. That's the bottom line. The cages that Biden complains about were the cages that Biden built during the Obama administration. 
these are issues that existed during his time as vice president and he is living with them now as president and doing a terrible job in reconciling the issues that exist at the border right now. He will not come to the border. Why will Joe Biden not come to the border to experience this himself? Where is his his leader who he appointed on this, Vice President Harris, where is she on this? You know, you would think that there would be a certain empathy to what these children are going through. And, and most of these children are likely to be trafficked children. They're coming through ne'er-do-well systems into this country to be given to whomever comes to receive them may or may not be related. This is a tragedy. It needs to be resolved. And the president needs to take responsibility and take action. Bill King, what's your take on this? Well, um, let me just say the, the reason this is happening is because of the instability of the governments in Central America. That's been going on for a long time. There's not any administration that's figured out the answer to that puzzle. Uh, what I find very frustrating is that we spend billions, it may be up to a trillion dollars now, halfway across the world in Afghanistan trying to stabilize things there. And we're not doing anything to deal with the problems in Central America. And let me just tell you, kids coming out of those kind of systems are going to be mistreated and abused, whether it's in Central America or whether they're waiting to get into Mexico or whether they're here in a facility in the United States. You know, no administration has distinguished themselves on handling this problem. And until we go deal with that root cause, which is the mess that Central America is, and the fact that we've got terrorist groups that we call cartels basically running those countries, this is going to continue to be a problem. Chow, we have allegations here of sexual abuse. Do you feel like the situation has been politicized to the detriment of the victims? Yeah, we're not talking about an open door policy. We're really talking about a humanitarian crisis. And make no mistake, these are children who are asylum seekers. They are not drug dealers. They're not criminals. They are coming over fleeing violence and desperate situations. And so if we're going to address the root causes, Bill says, we need to look at what those children are doing. I, I think shutting down and closing a facility to do what? To, to move them back to the border? How about we address the humanitarian crisis and get them with their families, whether it be here or on, on the other side in Central America and Mexico? And let's look at this asylum seeking issue. These are asylum seekers, and they sadly happen to be children. All right, Charles Bland, you watched this unfold this week. Did, uh, did Abbott make the right move by fronting this allegation in front of uh, the Coliseum? Well, I think he did because it got everybody talking about it. I mean, we spent $60 million a week housing these kids who are coming across the border. These facilities, many of the workers don't have CPR first aid certification. The child to staff ratio is very low. At night, these kids are dealing with a lot of issues because the staff isn't there to oversee them. They're unsupervised during showers. Things are happening there. We're ushering kids in from countries where they may be at, at risk, but we're ushering them into a broken system. And that's the problem is that you can't just have a good intention and say, okay, well, we're going to let them come in. If they're going to end up in a situation like this, there needs to be robust policy on that end too, to ensure that they're not being ushered into a system in which there's going to be more harm inflicted on them. And so I'm glad that we're talking about this, but we've been talking about this for a long time and nothing's happening to change it. All right, we're going to leave it right there. Next up, he got within striking distance in 2018. And after three years, Houstonian Mike Collier is convinced Texans want change more than ever. I'm talking one-on-one -on -one with a Democratic candidate for Lieutenant Governor when we come back. Welcome back. Three years ago, Houston Democrat Mike Collier drew 3.8 million Texas votes and came within five points of unseating Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. The former Price Waterhouse partner, Biden campaign advisor, and occasional Watcher Point panelist is convinced a foundation has been laid to do much better in 2022. We talked one-on-one -on -one about why he's seeking a rematch. So I have a skill in the private sector. It's solving complicated problems. I'm a financial watchdog. Uh, I would love to serve that up for the public good. We've got lots of problems that, needed to be solved, that need to be solved. Work hard, be honest, don't stay too long. You're a workhorse, he's a show horse. Is that what you're saying? We saw what happened with COVID. We see what happened with the grid. The legislature was warned by ERCOT. They said to them, 
failing to prepare is preparing to fail. They didn't solve that problem. So ERCOT went to the legislature in 2017 because we had a cold snap in 2016. And, and the legislature had been warned many times leading up to 2016 that we would not be able to handle a cold snap. ERCOT looked at the technical implications of getting through the 16 cold snap and came and said to the legislature in 2017, we won't get through a cold snap. And the legislature did absolutely nothing. To blame ERCOT makes no sense. To blame the legislature is the right, that's where the blame lies. Texas is one of 12 states which has refused to expand Medicaid. Uh, is Dan Patrick in part responsible for that? Uh, up to this point, he has been responsible and has shared responsibility for not expanding Medicaid, but he shares it with Greg Abbott and uh, Rick Perry was the first to say uh, falsely that it's a bad deal for Texas. Um, the business community has always supported expansion of Medicaid because a healthy workforce is a productive workforce. Morally, it's the right thing to do. Financially, it is a good deal. That's why most states have done it. And they're laughing at us because, you know, we're the ones that are getting a raw deal. They're getting a good deal. I knew Bob Bullock. He was the last Democratic Lieutenant Governor of Texas. Uh, his legacy was being able to work with Republicans. Uh, do you think you'll be able to work with Republicans? Well, I think I have to. I mean, I think I have to. That's what Texans expect. I mean, I, uh, I run around the state and I talk to a lot of people and uh, people are really sick. They're heart sick over all the fighting, the vitriol, people not working together. They don't want a partisan warrior, the lieutenant governor. Now, they want me to stand up for what I believe in and we'll make sure that we do right. But I, I would say this, Greg, um, I perceive Dan Patrick to be uh, the heart of the problem. I, I, I think when you take him out of the equation, just take him out of the equation, get him into retirement. Then you'll see a change. Then I think senators will be more uh, uh, accommodating of one another's point of view. I think that the governor would behave differently with Dan Patrick out of the way. Dan Patrick is a hyper-partisan warrior. It has been bad for our state. It's been bad for our policy. He's pit Texan against Texan. We see that in the way the legislature operates. We see that in policy, and he's got to go. Up next, a week of powerful testimony in the murder trial of former police officer Derek Chauvin as experts make increasingly clear why George Floyd's death was needless. The least amount of force necessary, a critical line of expert police testimony delivered this week in the murder trial of former Minneapolis officer Derek Chauvin. Policing experts testified further that use of force should automatically de-escalate once a suspect is handcuffed. That did not happen for Houston native George Floyd. Multiple experts this week ruled out fentanyl or methamphetamine overdose as the cause of death, leaving intact the prosecution assertion that George Floyd died of asphyxiation. Fortunately, we have our chief legal analyst, Chris Tritico, to break this down. Chris, what's your take? Well, look, this was a tough case from the beginning uh, for the defense, and, and they're, they're probably using the only defensive theory that they had available to them. Um, and the prosecution gave them a little bit of a nugget when they initially said they were that asphyxiation had nothing to do with it. Uh, and they changed that at the last minute in opening statement, said it was asphyxiation. But this is a very difficult defense case. And having been in, in cases like that, it's hard to cross-examine the witnesses and, and, and do what you need to do when, when, you're, when you've got everything stacked against you. The state did a really, really good job this week of closing all of the doors for the defense. The, the witness this week that uh, took the jury through the pictures and asked them to put their hands, this is your carotid artery, and this is where they closed off his windpipe. And that was very, very effective testimony and not much the defense could do uh, to, to close him out. And I think their theory of fentanyl uh, causing a heart attack is pretty much closed out. All right, Charles Blaine, I know you monitor this trial. Uh, does it seem to you as if uh, Chauvin is getting a, a, a fair shake here? Uh, yeah, I think he is getting a fair shake. It's it's just all the evidence that is coming out is not in his favor. Um, I, I just don't see anything that's really helping him, but it is a fair shake. What we found out this week was that three minutes and 27 seconds after George Floyd took his last breath, 
Chauvin's neck, uh, knee was still on his neck. And two minutes and 44 seconds after his pulse stopped, his knee was still on his neck. And so there was never an attempt to de-escalate the situation. And there was a pure disregard for life in this entire situation. And the medical examiner goes on to say that the that, that drugs were not the cause of death, which was an argument that many people, both involved in the case and just kind of watching it from a public perspective, tried to make. And so I think that really pulled, pulled that narrative, um, pulled the wind out of the, that narrative sails. And so it really does not look good for him. Him, but I am glad that we're getting all of this information and all of this is coming to light because what we're seeing as these weeks go on is that this is much worse than what we actually heard when it first happened. Chow, when we used to work the streets of Houston together as competing reporters, I know you covered trials. I know you covered uh, police violence or accusations of police violence. As you've watched this unfold, uh, what, what's your perspective? You know what, we have covered a lot of police trials, you and me, Greg, and other reporters, but what we haven't seen is police calling out their own. Make no mistake, this was a seminal week. This is police brutality and the blue line wall come crashing down. And let's, for a moment, recognize that it also highlights the biggest social movement in our country's history, and that's Black Lives Matter. You know, we didn't have to have this come to this. We didn't have to have a 17-year-old videotape the entirety of, of this incredible, tragic, awful murder. But it happened, police calling out their own. That's a big seminal moment for this country to see and witness. What do you think of that, Jessica? I mean, police have gotten on the stand and say, he wasn't trained that way. That was not all right. That was lethal force. We've heard we've heard police do that in, in with other cases um, and maybe clearly not as high profile as this. But if there's a bad actor who isn't following protocol and and um, uh, exemplifying a, a, a way of doing things that is not the way that police are trained to do things, you do see uh, police officers calling it as they see it. And that's what's clearly happening here on the world stage. All right, Bill, final 45 seconds to you. Well, I think the Chauvin case, as Chris says, is very difficult to defend. I think it's going to mostly turn now to what his state of mind was and what degree of homicide he's going to be convicted of would be my guess is the way the trial's going to go from here. I, you know, I think that the, the thing that's really changed in all this is, you know, these mobile phones that we carry around that are video cameras. I mean, you know, obviously these things have been going on before and they just weren't documented. And there was this really interesting case um, in Virginia, I think it was last night or the night before, where um, um, an African-American slash Latino army lieutenant in his army fatigues is pepper spayed and drug out of his car and handcuffed for supposedly not having a license plate. And it turns out there was a license plate up in the back window and the policeman just didn't see it. But there's all this video of it. And I just don't understand why these guys can't get through their heads that what you're doing is very likely gonna be captured on video. You think at some point in time, it would begin changing their conduct, but so far it doesn't seem to be. All right, well, we're gonna leave it there. Still ahead, President Biden waging war on gun violence, but without congressional support, how much can he really do? This is an epidemic, for God's sake, and it has to stop. President Joe Biden pleading with the nation to support his call for new restrictions on firearms. We've talked about it before, a ban on military-style semi-automatic rifles along with high-capacity magazines, closing the so-called gun show loophole with mandatory background checks on private firearm transactions, approval of red flag legislation to prohibit gun possession by the mentally unstable, and even reeling back the civil liability protections granted firearm manufacturers. The president can't do any of it without Congress. So with a flurry of executive actions, he's nipping around the edges with a crackdown on so-called ghost guns assembled from untraceable parts and regulation of stabilizing braces, which essentially convert pistol, pistols into more lethal, easily concealable, short-barreled rifles. Still not much appetite for the president's message in the Lone Star State, even after this week's mass shooting in Bryan. I'm giving Chris Tritico the floor on this one. Thanks, Greg. You know, 89 Americans are lost to gun violence every day. Four people are going to die before this show ends. 
Our mothers, our fathers, our, our children are being killed every day. My daughter Maria was one of them. I'm tired of people who pretend to represent me genuf genuflecting to the NRA and treating the Second Amendment like the 11th Commandment. You know, I've said it for years that the Second, Amend that the Second Amendment can be reasonably regulated and the Second Amendment can be reasonably regulated like the first and do, done so without infringing upon the rights of those who responsibly want to own weapons. And finally, Justice Antonin Scalia, one of our most conservative justices, agreed with me when he wrote the decision in the Heller case. Everyone should read it. It's a, it's a well-reasoned decision. Here's what we need. We need federally sponsored gun buyback prog program so that communities, cities and counties can buy back excess weapons so that the 16 year old punk who took my daughter's life won't have such easy access to a weapon. We need to close the gun show loophole. We need a national red flag law. We need universal background checks and a 10 day waiting period, just to name a few. You know, I wrote to President Biden, Vice President Harris, Governor Abbott, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, and Speaker Phelan, and I CC'd 33 senators, representatives, and, and the Attorney General. Those senators and speakers are on the state and national level. I heard back from just three people, two of them I'd never met. The ones who call me and ask for my money and checks and ask them to throw fundraisers for them, never bothered to call me, never wrote me back, never took up my offer to testify at a hearing or sit on a panel and help them and assist them in, in, putting, in putting in place reasonable restrictions. I'm tired of people who pretend to represent me telling me that today is not the day for a discussion about guns and gun violence. Because once my daughter's picture was placed on the National Gun Violence Memorial, I stopped waiting. If you're too feckless to lead if you're too, if you don't have the guts to lead on this issue, then please just get the hell out of the way. Thank, thanks, Chris. Real quickly, Chow, uh, the president is pushing re, uh, reinitiation of the uh, Violence Against uh, Women's Act. Chris, my heart, our heart breaks for you. And, and, and enough is enough, people. The Violence Against Women Act is once again, held up in politics because of guns. There is a loophole called the boyfriend loophole. We wanna close that loophole to include intimate partners, include boyfriends and dating partners, not just husbands and people you live with and the father of your children or the mother of your children. Uh, let, let's end this. This is common sense policy. It affects lives, it spills out into our community. Gun violence is, doesn't have a place in our communities. And we're gonna continue the conversation in future shows. Up next, huge plans and transformational change. Joe Biden has put plenty on the table, but is it all just sound and fury as long as the Senate filibuster remains in place? Political reality, the president will have little chance of pushing through his ambition agenda as long as the Senate filibuster rule remains in place. Just for the record, 60 senators must vote to end a debate and bring a bill up for a vote. The prospect of Democrats with their razor thin majority spiking the filibuster suffered a major blow this week when moderate West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin announced that under no circumstances would he vote to eliminate or weaken the filibuster. Panel, as the ultimate swing vote, Manchin has become quite literally the second most powerful politician in America. Jump on this, Bill King. Yeah, I'm really becoming a Joe Manchin fan, I gotta tell you. Um, you know, he said, he, he, he gave this interview this week where he said the January 6th changed him. And he said, I'm not going to engage in partisan politics anymore because it's tearing this country apart. I, I could not agree with him more. You know, the filibuster, while I don't entirely agree with the way it's being used today in all instances, it was designed to force the two parties to sit down and, and talk to each other. That was the whole purpose of it. And let me just tell you what, for Democrats that are anxious to go out there and get rid of it, you know, you may really regret that in two years because it's entirely possible this will flip back to the other side. And I think this whole movement in the Senate to weaken the filibuster 
on a whole variety of things, and, and both sides have been guilty of this. Let me just make it clear. I think has turned the Senate more and more partisan as we've gone along. And uh, look, I know we believe in majority rule, but we also believe in having representation of minorities in this country. And that's not just racial minority, it's political minorities, it's geographic minorities. And we need to get back to a system where, you know, we're working with everybody, all the groups to collaborate. Jessica, uh, I like that analogy mutually assured destruction kind of comparing the filibuster to cold war reality what's your take on this well this is a a critical part of of the procedural process that exists in the u.s senate and uh it's as bill said has been used by both parties and now joe manchin is the most lobbied person in washington dc on a variety of issues um this is really when you better know who you are and what you believe because you're going to have to answer for it to the public to the world um and clearly at home to your constituents um and you know west virginia is a very interesting state to hold such authority um they have independent views on 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 many issues even though it is typically a conservative state and you're really seeing that come through uh with senator manchin and you are seeing him i think be judicious on a variety of issues um, and present substantive thought on why he is taking the actions that he is gonna leave it there up next the controversy over vaccine passports After losing half a million countrymen to COVID-19, should every American have one? Controversy is beginning to boil over the concept of the vaccine passport, or more simply, proof of inoculation. It's the kind of documentation cautious private companies may require before allowing employees to return to the pre-pandemic workplace. Opponents say any passport requirement is discriminatory on its face and a violation of individual rights. But supporters argue it's the safest route to fully reopen the economy. Panel, does anybody see a slippery slope here in terms of precedent? I'm gonna start with you, Charles Blaine. I I see a slippery slope when government gets involved. I do have, you know, give private companies the ability to regulate how they see fit. If If a concert production company wants to require proof of vaccination upon ticket purchase, well, then I'm going to have to deal with that if I want to go to a concert. And that's going to be my decision whether or not I want to attend that. I think where you start to get weird into a shady area is when you start to see things like 14 colleges around the country, including Rutgers University in New Jersey, a public a public school are saying now that they are going to require full vaccination when people will come back. And so in certain states where um, state governors have come out and said that they're not going to require it, it's going to be interesting to see how they reconcile those two differences. Okay, Chow, as a mom and a health worker, what do you think of this? This is a public health issue. Just like there was resistance to wearing seat belts, mandating seat belts, and there was resistance to vaccines. Look, my kids can't go to school without their vaccinations. They can't do things that that are and and at the end of the day this is in the interest of public safety let's look at it from that model all right jessica you have a different viewpoint certainly and even the federal government even anthony fauci at least today he could change his mind but today he says the federal government is not going to take up a vaccine program um this is this is a dangerous precedent and this is something that we have seen that um people respond uh right now getting back to normal there's lots of travel uh they're not required right now on planes and i think you know a lot of people like to talk about the airline industry uh starting to clamp down on this and provide passports i think you will start you will see people choose not to do that. Um, So you see the federal government, you see state governments not looking to mandate vaccines. And if private entities begin to want to do this, uh, to mandate it, you're going to see a backlash. Uh, This is just playing out right before our eyes. And this is a foregone conclusion that vaccine passports will, will not have a long life at all. King, give us a 20 second nugget of wisdom. Well, I think you will see it in some private settings, like there's already several airlines that have announced it. Some of you actually use it as marketing. You know, if you get on our plane, everybody's been vaccinated. But let me tell you, people kind of assume pandemics go on forever. They don't. This time next year, we're not going to be talking about this. All right, still ahead. The shameless fundraising grift inflicted on thousands of unsuspecting voters. A textbook example of just how low some campaigns are willing to stoop for access to your cash. 
The Trump campaign under fire this week after returning $122 million in campaign contributions. A significant portion of it collected through recurring donations unwittingly approved by supporters who failed to uncheck a box to opt out of repeat donations. As a result, thousands of donors gave far more money than they intended, with many submitting fraud claims. This shady pre-check box technique is apparently still in play. How about this one from the National Republican Congressional Committee, which reads, quote, we need to know we haven't lost you to the radical left. If you uncheck this box, we will have to tell Trump you're a defector. Panel, surprise, surprise, Democrat Fundraiser Act Blue also used the pre-check boxes to maximize contributions. Chris, what do you think of this? I think it's fraud, and I think anyone who's using this, whether it's a political party or a private company, ought to, ought to be indicted for doing this to unsuspecting members of the public. I hope Congress will act on this, and, and if it's not banned already, it ought to be illegal. And I hope somebody gets indicted over this and goes to prison, period. I mean, this is just, it's unconscionable that $122 million was taken from unsuspecting people. So somebody ought to somebody ought to go to prison over this, no matter what the party is. Period. Jess, what's your take on this? I mean, do both sides do it? Yes. You know, this is a process, and you see it when you go to give a political contribution that you can give a monthly contribution. You know, there's different time frames in which you could choose to continue to give a contribution. Usually, a campaign shuts down shuts down its bank account and you can't contribute anymore. Uh, you know, if you forget to uncheck that box or you just, usually there's an automatic shutdown because the campaign shuts down and, and clearly that didn't happen in this case. You know, to Chris's point, I, I don't know, I guess if there's an investigation, we'll find out if people knowingly chose to leave this on. Um, but the fact is the money was returned, which is the right thing to do. And um, this is a, a great case in point that a clever way to continue to raise money that people opt into um, can absolutely come back if the campaign doesn't close out its accounts as it should after an Bill, election. real quickly, this just doesn't pass the smell test. Look, we have two totally corrupt political parties that don't give a damn about solving problems. All they care about is maintaining power. Stop sending them money. Stop supporting them. Fire both of them. All right, I think we're going to have to leave it right there. Well, wait a second. Chow, you have anything to say on that issue? Look, we do monthly giving at the nonprofit where I work. It's cha-ching, but it should not be the onus of the donor to to red flag it, right? And flag it and say, I want my money back. Yeah, we got to end this. All right. It could be a now time we're leaving. that it shuts now off. we're leaving. Thanks for joining us. The conversation continues on a national level next with Fox News Sunday and host Chris Wallace. From all of us here, have a safe and healthy week.